welcome back to Garden Studio. I'm Tessa Pinner, a designer and gardener in Upstate South Carolina, Zone 8A. Today's video is on the topic of pruning roses. I'll walk through three different varieties of roses. First, an English climbing rose, trained up in arched trellis. Second, a non-English kind of wild rambling rose, trained flat on a wall and third, an English shrub rose. I'll do a before and after of each of those three and share some of my thoughts on why and how I'm approaching the pruning for each one. This rose right here is David Austin, generous gardener, climbing rose. And right now, is the perfect time to prune it. I can see which stems are leafing out. I can see which ones are not. And as you can see, this is trained up and over an arch. I've had this rose for four years now, and every year it just gets more and more robust. But it does mean in time that I have to go back and edit out the three rules of thumb with pruning, dead or dying, diseased, and damaged. So dead's pretty explanatory. Anything that's not leafing out looks gray. That's dead. Diseased, it's hard to tell at this point in the season because most diseases show up a little bit later. And with roses, they can take the form of something that is going to be lethal for the stem or something like black spot that really you either need to spray, your whole plant will get it. So you can't really prune out everything. And then damage, if canes are crossing and rubbing on each other, causing a wound, that's just an invitation for infection or some other kind of bacteria to get in. And so that would be a good one to prune out. But by far, it's the dead canes that we want to look at. Anything that's really old, not producing anymore, we cut it out. So I'm pretty geared up here. I wore a outer layer that's not going to catch easily and i actually have rose pruning gloves these i got last year someone gave them to me and this is their their debut so we'll see how they do but the point is that they have a longer neck on them that will protect your forearms a big mistake would be to go short sleeved or leaving your arms unprotected because reaching in the rose thorns are pretty wicked so I'm going to start by going back and evaluating. I don't mind a pretty overflowing look, but I can see right away that there are dead pieces in here. And I have tied a significant number of these together. So it's going to be a process of looking, deciding which tool is best for the job. So I think I'm going to start with my Felco pruners. Sometimes part of a branch will be dead or part of a, a shoot will be dead and it'll be alive further towards the base. So I'm looking on this, it looks gray here, but there's a lot of lively new growth coming off of it. So I'm going to leave it. But this piece here, dead. And this just takes a little bit of time. Some people like to prune back to a pretty minimal structure. It's not really the look that I want if it's healthy and potentially going to produce, I'll leave it. It is good to note that on a climbing rose, your vertical support stocks are not what produce blooms. What produce the blooms are the horizontal pieces that come off and anything horizontal or 45 degrees or more is going to give you your blooms. So you'll see a lot on tutorials about pruning roses to, to take and fan at a 45 at least. That's for bloom production. I don't really have that luxury here until I get to the top of the arch and then they're being trained that way. But my hope for blooms on the vertical stems are really all of these little horizontal pieces coming off. So I'll deadhead them, but I'm not gonna reduce those back. 
I don't want to get rid of them. I want to leave them to produce blooms. And I didn't deadhead at the end of last year. I just let the rose hips exist over the winter. And so this is my first touch on this rose since last spring. You can see here's a dead piece here that's dead all the way back to the base. I'll take it all the way out. I do have to significantly tie these up. So I'll prune and then tie probably towards the end. This one's dead. I'm already grateful for these long gloves. So I will do the rest of the shrub in this manner and give a little tour of it at the end. The Generous Gardener is all done and volume is not greatly reduced, really just deadheaded and removed any dead canes. I can see some canes that are at about two inches in diameter and starting to look pretty old and gnarly, but they're still really producing well, so I'm leaving them. And one interesting view when you have kind of a freestanding rose like this, it helps me to get behind it where it is between me and the source of light. So me and the sun, I'm on this side of it, and I can really see the silhouette even better when I'm trying to spot anything dead that needs to be reduced. It is time to fertilize this rose. I may do another video on my care regimen for my roses, but it is really flushing out and hopefully in about a month or so, I will have some really gorgeous blush pink blooms. You can see a little bit on the other side, I actually have the same rose, Generous Gardener by David Austin, and they were planted at the same time, but this one gets a couple more hours of light than the other and it is a drastic contrast of just how much more vigorous healthier i think probably this might be the other roses last season and i may grow something else up that other side of the arch because if you read that a rose is going to do okay in heart shade would we'll just be skeptical pretty much most roses really need a lot of sun if they're going to put out a good show of flowers. This rose here is called Sally Holmes. It is not an English rose. It is a open flowered, almost a rambler type of rose, not a double petaled luscious one like the Generous Gardener. This has much more of a wild look and I like that as well. So I have planted this one two years ago and it has done so well against this wall. This is my chance to get more of those 45s that I was talking about that are a little bit harder to do when training up a straight vertical. Because I have a lateral space on this wall, I can go sideways and probably will do some more tying in sideways this year. My goal is to not obscure the window, but to really just get this up this whole face of the wall. And we have a starter trellis underneath and then some strategic, just very small, discrete screws into the masonry that we're just tying off because I didn't want the look of a big trellis. So my job with pruning this one, I can see the structure more. It's actually a bit easier than pruning the ones that are all overlapping on that arch. But I'll come in here and look for the same thing. Dying, diseased, damaged. See right away, that's a dead piece. And because this isn't an old rose, I don't have a ton of defunct canes coming from the bottom yet. Probably in the next couple years, they'll start aging out. But these ones that it started with two years ago are still pretty vigorous. Here. As I go along, I am making a few additional cuts for shape 
even though I like the wild look, I will continually be fighting a cane that's coming straight forward by trying to pull it back, pull it back. There are plenty of ones already heading back. So that I am going to just go ahead and prune off. I do plan to plant something kind of at the legs of this rose, eventually something a little bit larger than these iris. So I am making a couple of pruning cut decisions. This one is bendy enough. I can get it to go. This one, I like that it's low. I may pull it back that way. It's still young and soft enough. Anything pointing straight forward, I'll go ahead and remove that, not for health, simply for the form of the rose. This won't be a big job at all. I don't need it totally flat, so I'll do a prune on this and show the result at the end. Sally Holmes is finished. This rose has a really nice arching habit all on its own. I'm letting it just go ahead and do that. And if I get really long additional shoots of growth this season, I'll just make more effort to tie them in. But for now, I've pruned off anything that was coming straight forward away from the wall. So this is essentially a espalier with a little bit, a fluffy espalier, she'll say. And taken off any old blooms from last season, any canes that looked dead, I've reduced those. But this is a pretty carefree rose and I'm really looking forward to its spring bloom. A best practice with pruning of any kind, but specifically a very disease prone plant like a rose, is to have a way to sterilize your snips or secateurs between each plant, or even within the same plant. If you see a cane that is clearly diseased and want to snip that one out, but then continue pr pruning the rest of the plant, you definitely want to sterilize between. So something that probably everybody has is rubbing alcohol. This does just fine if you get a little plastic container that you don't mind having outside. Wow, that's really slow. Unscrew it here. And getting just enough in here that you can dip the tips. So between each cut, you can dunk, give them a shake and keep going. I've read some places that you should leave them in for 30 seconds. Sure. If it's really something scary, like rose rosette or rose mosaic, you should probably yank out the plant. But if you're trying to save something that's really scary, leave it in the 30 seconds, be super safe. Otherwise, if you're just doing best practice, you could dunk in between and keep on going. This is another David Austin shrub format rose. This is Windermere. I did some research specifically on David Austin roses that are good for the Southeast. And I'll put a link to that in the episode notes because it is worth getting varieties that are more heat and humidity tolerant. They don't get black spot quite as quickly as some of the others. And you can see I did have black spot on this rose last summer. So if you don't spray a lot, I don't spray a lot. I will occasionally spray organic, but I don't do a lot of the conventional rose spray. It's worth getting varieties that are a little bit naturally tougher. One additional consideration with a shrub clumpy format rose is pruning for airflow. So there are a lot of little kind of twiggy branches in the interior. And one thing that produces disease in a rose is not having enough air moving around the leaves. If things are too densely packed, that gets water on the foliage, let's say for a rain or with a sprinkler, and then it can't dry quickly enough, that produces disease. So some of the pruning I'll be doing on the interior will be specifically towards getting rid of anything that's too small and twiggy, encouraging a more open framework for disease resistance. This has definite, definite potential for pruning. This one I will thin out more significantly. I left the hips 
on all winter and I'll go through same process, deadhead, dying, and anything that looks like it's just not doing well, I'll get rid of and I will show you the result at the end. As I was editing my video, I realized two things. One, I lost all of my audio for the recap on pruning Windermere. And secondly, I had a mild crisis of confidence. What am I doing talking about pruning roses? Do I really know enough to be sharing on this topic? And I asked my friend, my good friend, Molly Hendry, who has worked for a decade in a very high level public horticulture, Molly, if you had to give people some instruction on pruning roses, what would you say? And she gave one very, well, she said some really wonderful things, but one thing that I hadn't even touched on that I wanted to mention that I'm going to give her full credit for is a really helpful rule of thumb. And that is that if you are pruning back a stalk, you should look at which direction the bud is pointing. So for instance, if you are trying to select for more full growth in the middle of the plant, you would want to prune back to right above a shoot that is pointing inward. If you are trying to reduce the amount of choking material in the middle of the plant, you would want to encourage the shoots to go outward. So that is pertinent to the disease discussion with roses, wanting to have a more open framework. So wherever you prune down to, choose the bud with the future shoot activation that is going to go the direction that you want. I thought that was an amazing tip. So thank you, Molly, for that one. And another one is just general encouragement. So we have the horticultural health guidelines when it comes to pruning, and then there is a whole lot of freedom. There is very much an artistic license when it comes to where to prune, what do you keep, what do you get rid of, and some of it is what look are you going for? It's as simple as that. Once you take the health guidelines into consideration, are you wanting to keep it compact? Are you wanting to let it go big? This one, I didn't reduce the size by a whole lot because I want it to compete with some other very tall perennials that come up here and rival the size of the rows. So if I were to come back and chop this rose, it could actually potentially get swamped by the other things around it later in the season. And I really want it to hold its own. So I made the choice not to do big reduction cutting. Instead, I came and thinned out the middle. That was my main goal, was to get a more open structure for airflow this year. Here's an example of a cut that I already made. So you can see this little shoot going inward. I know I just said that I'm not going to generally prune for shoots going in, but in this case, I have kind of a vacuum in this area right here and I want something to grow into it. So I cut back to this point so that this would be activated to grow towards the middle. Thanks for watching. Don't forget your sturdy gloves and your long sleeves and happy pruning.